give you, if I can, my insight into uh, where we've been over the last few sessions, uh, where we're at and where we're going, um, uh, as far as I can tell in my crystal ball right now. So uh, with that, I'd just like to start. I hate to do uh, PowerPoint presentations, but some of this information I think is better seen about it and probably would be lost on you if I, I kept kept talking so I'll go ahead and uh, work through it and I will figure out how this works I'm gonna guess there we go so w where do we stand um, this is not, not information that you're unfamiliar with um, we have the highest foreclosure rate in the nation with about 54 percent of our home sales in foreclosure we have the highest unemployment rate 14.2 percent in the nation it's 19 or 9.8 um, we obviously depend on our discretionary spending of others from around the uh, country to um, bolster our economy and we'll talk about that a little bit so as the rest of the world and the rest of the country starts to come back so will Nevada um, I'm gonna figure this out there we go nope that's going back uh oh, I'm in trouble. Somebody's going to have to help me, I guess. Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, that's even easier. Okay. Beautiful. All right, so we have the largest general uh, fund deficit in the nation. Um, I'll give you a slide on that. Nevada ranks at the top, where our budget shortfall is about 54%. So we've got some tough times uh, in front of us. Um, where do we rank? Well, Nevada ranks at the second lowest tax burden in the country and the fourth bi best business tax climate, which is a good thing. Um, we have, as you are well aware, the lowest um, or the fewest state and local employees per capita ranking us way down at number 51 in the nation. So we have a low tax burden, and then we have the leanest uh, government in, in the country. Some will argue that, but this is, as far as I know, true. <laughs> Where do our revenues come from? Our revenues come from a couple different places, but mostly about 57.3% of those revenues comes, comes from sales and gaming. So we've relied a lot on the construction industry, we relied a lot on the gaming industry, and obviously not, neither one of those industries are doing well now, and that is where a bulk of our revenue comes from. So what does that support? That supports about 93% of that supports three things. Uh, about 55% of that supports education, either K through 12 or higher education. About 30% is health and human services. About 8, 9% is prisons uh, and public safety. And then the rest uh, makes up the rest, which would be parks and uh, libraries and uh, uh, museums and, and, the, and the like. So when people say, why don't you just shut down all the museums, all the parks in the state, that wouldn't get us there, not even close. Um, so where do we stand again? We're uh, near the bottom in every quality of life factor. Um, that's making it tough for us to bring in new business. Uh, we're 47th in quality of life, um, and they, we rank that based on schools, health, crime, cost of living, living poverty rates. We're 47th overall rank, in uh, business, so we're 37th for quality of life, 50th for education. So where are we on uh, all these categories that we just talked about, the three categories, uh, education, health and human services, and prisons? In education, we're near the bottom. We're 43rd in per pupil funding. We're 46th in higher education per capita expenditures. We're 45th in residents with bachelor degrees or higher, and we're 41st in 18 to 24 year olds who enroll in college. And the health, health and human services side, that other big chunk that we uh, pay out at the state level, we're last in children without health insurance, we're last in the number of women without prenatal care, and we're second uh, highest in suicide rate, and we're 46th in the number of children who are fully immunized. Public safety, we're second highest in violent crime, 
as we just saw, and we have a high robbery rate. So that's where we stand. That's where we've been. Now, what have we done? Because I think there's a, a little bit of mis misinformation about what we've already cut. We've cut over a billion dollars through the last two set sessions and the last special session. So I'll just go through some of those cuts quickly for you. In the 2008 and 2009 uh, session, we cut $176 million out of the K-12 budget. We slashed our text textbooks by 50%. We cut our library books by 15%. We reduced all our programs for gifted and talented students. And we cut our adult education programs. And then in 2009, we came back and we did it again. We cut textbooks, we cut supplies, and we cut instructional materials. We uh, cut our grant support for our underperforming schools, the ones that need it the most, and we slashed our teachers' training funds. On the higher education side, we cut a, a, a total of $450 million out of that budget. We lost 674.75, um, that was a three quarters of a person apparently, uh, full-time positions. Um, we cut 24 degree programs out of the, uh, the, the degree programs, and we increased our fees. Everybody you hear sometimes, well, why don't they just increase the fees? Well, we have. We've increased those fees by 31%, costing the students going to school about $52.2 million more in the last two bienniums. And here's the kicker, uh, the demand's still growing. People are going to school, they're going to our community colleges, and the number of students grew by 8.6%, while at the same time we were, we were cutting. On the health and human services side, and this is where it really gets ugly, I think, we cut another 142 million there. We cut the personal care services to the elderly and the disabled. We cut Medicaid payments. We closed two mental health clinics. We uh, had a hiring freeze for the eligibility staff. Those are the folks where when you come in to say, I, I'd like to apply for some of these benefits, we don't even have anybody at the counter because we're cutting those staff. Um, we cut personal, assistant, personal assistance, and I think you saw some of the, I think there was something in the Reno paper recently about this, for dramatic, uh, traumatic brain injury, for autism, and for ind independent living programs where we try to keep people in the home instead of putting them in a facility. Then we came back in 2009 and we cut some more. Uh, the both the 2009 and the special session, um, we closed 22 hospital beds at our mental health facility. We lowered our Medicare and Medicaid uh, reimbursements. We cut funding for uh, uh, the disabled. Um, we reduced our substance abuse programs and we uh, cut our capacity at our youth correctional facilities. Speaking of uh, correctional facilities, what did we do there? Well, we cut uh, about 26.7 million in 2008, and then we cut another 9 million in 2009. Uh, we closed our correctional facilities, including uh, the Southern Nevada Correctional Facility, the Silver Springs Conservation Camp, and we delayed several projects at the, at the prison. We froze 20% of our positions within the, in the prison system, and we um, eliminated our DUI treatment program. Um, that actually affected the private sector as well because those were outside contractors that we had to cut that program. Um, we closed 100 beds uh, in the special session at the uh, Women's Correctional Center and we closed unit number eight at the uh, Nevada State Prison. Again, we also reduced the Medicare rates uh, to those folks that were providing services in the prison. Parole, parole and probation, what did we do there? We had a hiring freeze there and we got uh, 90 unfilled or 90 positions remained unfilled. In 2009, in the special session, we also then cut 23 public safety officers' positions, uh, which meant that their caseloads just went up. So, just so you know, we we've, we've been cutting. <laughs> um, so, where are we at now? The economic forum met just the other day. They said that we would have 5.3 billion dollars of revenue for the next two fiscal years. Um, that puts us about 1.1 billion short of meeting our general fund obligation. However, there's more to it than the general fund obligation. Uh, in the last legislative session, we took our money, uh, federal money, to the tune of about $600 million. Uh, we cut uh, employees' pay, merit pay, furloughed uh, employees to a tune of about $500 million. We had about 300 million that we took out of the um, 
the general fund to fund other programs outside of the general fund. And so that total is about $2.7 billion that we're short in this next legislative ses session. Little hard to see, but this is a graphic representation. You'll hear the both numbers out there. The one on the left is the 1.1 billion uh, where the general fund is, uh, we're short on revenue on the general fund. On the right, you'll see what I just explained, the 2.7 where our school support tax uh, is outside of the general fund that we have to supplement with the general fund, which are, uh, uh, in, in, which includes also our um, ARA money, six, that 600 million I talked about, and the, the pay, longevity pay, merit pay, all those things that we cut that we would have to reinstitute in this next legislative session to a tune of about $2.7 billion. So now what? Um, so the executive department, as you know, the, the governor-elect has the obligation to bring us a budget. He'll bring us that budget um, on the 24th of January and present that. Um, the current governor has asked for a 10% cut. Um, those reductions are about 819 million. Doesn't, doesn't quite get us there, um, but let me just tell you what those cuts are, that additional 819 on top of what we've already talked about. In education, that's gonna mean the basic support for a pupil will go down again. It'll eliminate full day kindergarten and it'll eliminate our education technology and career centers. Um, it'll also eliminate this or suspend at least uh, the, no, uh, the norm reference test. The norm reference tests are what we use to compare ourselves to others so that we can see if we are making progress. So some of the comment is that folks would like to see us do merit pay or incentives to teachers. We would have to cut our reference tests to figure out how to, how to do a merit pay system uh, uh, under this scenario. Um, in the Department of Health and Human Services, we'd have to cut the prevention and problem gaming areas, the senior citizens property tax assistance department, the senior mental health outreach, um, we would eliminate almost all optional services provided under the Medicaid program. What some of those programs include in-home health personal care, which I described earlier where we try to keep people in their home, the adult day health care and home-based rehab, where we try to keep them out of the facilities, we try to do that at their home, uh, dentures, and some of the vision services. Um, we'd also have additional cuts in the rates that we would pay our skilled nursing facilities. Um, and uh, Medicaid clients for certain inpatient hospitals. What else would that include? Uh, it would include uh, the, the elimination of our Mamavan breast cancer detection program. Um, <laughs> it would uh, eliminate all the funding for non-medical room and board expenses for mental health treatment. Um, we would have to reduce the beds at uh, Nevada Youth Correction Facility um, and several others. It's fairly ugly. Department of Prisons, we would have to close Nevada State Prison. Um, we would have to eliminate the pay for differential pay for rural areas. Um, that, as you know, some of our prisons are in Lovelock and Ely and places like that, and we pay people extra to go out to locations that, uh, that are rural and remote. We would not be able to do that anymore. The Department of Public Safety, we would have to raise the number of folks that people would uh, supervise from 70 to 80. 70 is already the highest in the nation, or close to the highest in the nation of the people, uh, the, the folks that are being supervised by a parole agent. Um, and we would have to eliminate all the staff uh, for the pardons board. So this is where we're at. Uh, we could, this is an amazing fact, I think, we could right now have the largest budget cut in the history of Nevada and the largest tax increase and we still wouldn't make the shortfall. So we'll, what are we gonna do? Well, the legislature's gonna convene here in a, a few short months. We are constitutionally mandata mandated to get that done in 120 days. I know some people are uh, anticipating that we won't, but um, we're gonna get it done in 120 days. Um, we have to use these economic forum projections that were just given to us a few weeks ago. Um, and we have to, by the Constitution, balance our budget. We, we don't run like the federal government. We have to balance our budget. There's no simple solution. Obviously, if there was a simple solution, we would have already done that. Um, so here's what I think we have to do. 
I think it's going to be a, a combination of these things. I think we have to start with cuts. I think we have to have uh, government reform on spending. Um, that includes us. That includes you. I know you're going to say you're doing it. I just showed you that we're doing it. So I think we need to do uh, government reforms. I think we have to have long-term government reforms. We have to look at our public employee retirement system. We're going to have to look at how we stabilize those, long, those systems long-term. Then we have to look at our economic development strategies. Um, I'm afraid that we have too many agencies doing too many things in the economic development agency uh, arena without it being focused. I think we need to focus that. Uh, I think we need to look at areas that we can uh, bring in economic development from outside uh, that would include medical tourism, would go, include IT, would include uh, obviously there's no reason why we shouldn't be the alternative energy, solar, geothermal capital uh, of the world. Um, we should be doing all those things. The, um, the fourth thing is I think we have to have a vision for Nevada's future. One thing I will give you a lot of credit for at the city level, as you know I'm, I work for a city as well, is we do some long-term planning. We you know, have a capital improvement plan that goes five years and ten years. The state, we really haven't done that. Every time there's a new elect, uh, election and a new body elected, that capital improvement plan changes. We have to look out to the future. We have to go out five and ten years and plan for the future. We did a little bit of uh, that, I think, in this interim with what we, myself and Senator Horsford, called our uh, Nevada Vision Stakeholder Group, where we asked Nevadans how, how they want the state to look. Um, and then finally, when we do all that, after we look at the cuts and we look at the reforms and we work on economic development, we have our vision set for the future. If there's revenue out there that we still need, then we need to look at that. Um, the opportunity is now, I think, to stabilize our revenue sources, um, take the up and down out of our tax system and broaden our tax base. Will we get there? I don't know. But with what you've seen, we've cut. What you've seen, if we cut more, where we're going to be uh, and where you see our revenue projections at, um, I, I believe we're going to be going down that path. So sorry I took so long. I tried to keep it as quick as possible, but there was a lot to tell you. Um, I'm open for questions and appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much for your presentation. And obviously, there, there's a lot of ground to cover, and, and I know some of us sit in the sidelines and say, why can't you cut here? Why can't you cut there? I, I think you've done a good job in, in establishing what you have cut and what you're facing. So if you'll hang on. Uh, Councilman Dork, do you have any questions? Any questions of uh, Mr. Oseguera? Uh, I, I do. <clears throat> the, um, make sure I understand the $2.7 billion that we're talking about. Is that in the, in the event that some of these pay cuts or freezes that, you, that you've already taken get reactivated? That is part of the equation there. There's, a, there's really three things. There's the, uh, the pay cuts, the merit pay, the, the furloughs, which is about $500 million. We, we Some people are taking for granted that we're going to do that again. I think we will, right. but we have to do that again. We have to take a vote on that, and that's a tough vote. We promised folks so that we'd do it for two years, and it's two years later, and now we're going to say we're going to do it for another two years. So that's part of that. And then the other part is the $600 million in uh, right. ARA funds. Uh, the other part is the school support tax. And then the final, there's about $300 million that are other things that we were able to pay for out of the general fund that we supplemented with ARA funds that we used general fund monies last time that we have to replace with general fund monies. That's what I understood you to say. So if you were to take that action again for another two years, that 2.7 would go to what? 2.1? 2. 2. Yeah, 2.1, 2.2. And then you also, know, obviously the concern of local government is, you know, what's the legislator going to do to, to local government? And obviously we can't budget for that because we don't know what, what's in store. Is there any commitment? And I know you're not the only one, but any commitment because obviously we're, we're making our own cuts here locally to have a, another cut of let's say six or eight million dollars would be devastating to this community I mean obviously we we have a reduced parks and recreation staff and the list goes on and on including public safety do you see that as a last resort at looking at local government well two things one the person the people that are proposing uh, the local government issue are, are, are not these people <laughs> Understood. <laughs> are not this branch. 
But the, the, the governor certainly has the uh, first shot at it, right? He presents the budget. Um, but second of all, I think we ought to look for areas where we can collaborate, coordinate, consolidate. And I, you know, I think that you guys have been more um, receptive to that than others. Uh, and when I say, uh, I say that, I mean whether it's the state that does it or the, the county or the city that does it or vice versa. Who, who should be doing it and who, should, who can do it best? Who can best serve the public? Because quite frankly, in my opinion, we're all serving the same con constituents. So does that necessarily mean a hit to you? Not necessarily because we may be trading some services. Who does them the best? So I think we should look for those opportunities. Um, but as far as uh, a, a strong commitment that we're, n we're not going to come looking, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of places to look left. Right. <clears throat> well, I think what you, a couple of things you said are encouraging, and, and this will be my last comment, because ultimately if you give us that enabling legislation to consolidate and deal with the expense side of local government, then I think that goes a long ways. I mean, people have even talked about giving us home rule, which would give us a lot more authority and power to deal with our local problems. If, if, if there's some openness of dealing with in, in that regard, then I think we, we can make a lot of progress. And I'll just tell you as one individual legislator, um, I'm interested in looking at home rule. I probably am not looking at uh, a wholesale home rule. Understood. And you know, I also caution you to be careful what you wish for. Um, because there's some some problems that come along with that. Um, if we do get to the revenue side, certainly I don't want to see uh, us going to the revenue side and then at the local government level you raising revenue as well on the people that we just told this is all we're going to do to you. Right. So you know there may be some compromise there with caps or whatever we might be able to do to facilitate that working relationship. And quite frankly, that's what I want to do is come here and talk so that we can have that conversation. Okay, well, I pre for one, I appreciate you coming because it's very helpful. Absolutely. <clears throat> Any other questions? Councilman Spraza? Yeah, um, thank you, Speaker, for presenting to us. We just had the ballot question up here advisory. In fact, we have it later on the agenda and it passed again in this community for consolidation. So one of the things I'd ask you is what you would need from us, because it would take several legislative changes to actually make it happen. Um, there's been several in the community who have supported it over the years, having three building departments, for example. We have a consolidated fire department up here already. Um, to really move this forward, um, I think there could be some cost savings involved in that and efficiencies. Um, what does the legislature need from uh, uh, the city of Reno to make that happen? Well, I'm not sure exactly what we need from you. In, in, I'll tell you this. I mean, we did this study last time uh, in the interim, and I, I'll call it the, D, the reasons we can't do consolidation study. It was supposed to be a consolidation study, and I'm just being frank with you. Uh, I, it was all the reasons why we couldn't consolidate. And again, I give you guys credit because you were more um, receptive to the ideas, but that study didn't work out too well as far as I'm concerned. It just shows all the reasons why we couldn't do it. Um, I think there's different ways to do consolidation, whether it's wholesale consolidation or functional consolidation, um, or, you know, like you mentioned, why do we have to have several building departments? Some of those things work. Um, I've got a group working on some of the consolidation issues. Um, I will have them reach out, um, just trying to put in place all the the legal issues, the research issues, the you know the constitutional issues, all the things that come to, into play, you know it, it's a it's a heavy lift, but I, I'm not saying I, I I'm not afraid of that, and I think it can be done. And then the other issue is with the new census and and the north now um, going over the four hundred thousand mark, all the legislation that that changes um, now because of that. Um, do you anticipate just increasing? Uh, the population cap, um, that affects um, anywhere from how we charge our gaming properties for slot machines to um, additional elected uh, representation up here in the north. Do you, do you have any kind of idea where the legislature is going to go with that cap? 
I don't have an idea, but I can tell you historically what we've done is just raise the cap. As the population has gone up, we've continued to raise the cap. So in my tenure in the legislature, we've raised that. And so I, I would assume, which is tough to, bad to do, but I would assume that we would raise that cap again unless there was a good reason not to. And then the other question I had is on the PERS rate. We just got um, some information um, that says that's going to raise uh, both for general and public safety employees. When do you actually enact that rate? Um, would that be done during the session? It would. Um, uh, I believe so. Uh, I believe they bring in a kind of an omnibus PERS bill that comes over to enact that. And would that take effect then for local governments, to your knowledge, for the next fiscal year, for the local government's next fiscal year? So, for example, July 1st? I don't know for sure, so I, I don't want to answer that, but I, that seems correct. <laughs> and then just, Mr. Mayor, I just appreciate you coming, and we did have that meeting um, last year. Um, we know that you're from the south, but you've always been um, gracious to all of us up here in the north, but the local government meeting that we have with the legislators, I thought that was very productive. And just getting back to what uh, Councilman um, Hashchev said, as far as our budgeting um, goes, we're gonna start in January again, um, looking at uh, areas um, where we're gonna have to cut. So it would just be good to have a hold. Typically we get down there and then we find out that um, you know these funds are are, um, I mean, there's been a diversion of local revenue in the past. Um, so if I think to have a heads up of, of where we're going is, is going to both help you and, and help us with our budgets in the future. And I appreciate that you came today and appreciate uh, the meetings that you've had in the past with local governments. Thank you. And we uh, just recently, just FYI, met with the, uh, the mayors in southern Nevada with my chairwoman of uh, government affairs. And one of the ideas was to have another uh, one of those meetings. And I, I believe they're setting that up. And so um, pre-session. I was going to ask that. I mean, is that a pre possibility to get mm -hmm. that going in January? And that would that just include southern Nevada? Or would that include statewide local governments? No, that governments? would include statewide. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? Like the other council, I appreciate that, that you took the time to come here and explaining it. And I would just put in one comment. I know everybody has their, their, their key issues. But having served on the governor's uh, commission for aging for about three years, you touched on this. And I, I, I saw the expression on your face when you talk about Medicare and you talk about some of the services for the seniors. When you eliminate those, it exacerbates the system and, and the expense on the system because when those things aren't available, certainly in Reno and Las Vegas, but what's even more severe is in the rural counties. Mm -hmm. They really don't have enough services to start with. And when the people don't have that in-home care and they're forced to go to another facility, it just exacerbates. And I know you understand this, and I'm just kind of putting a soft word in your ear here because everybody has their own reason for saving whatever it is in the budget. But that, that's a crucial element because there are people who, in many cases, can't fend for themselves. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And please uh, feel free to contact me anytime. Thank you, Mr. Osagara.